This system might be one of the best options for a versatile home server that I've looked at on this channel. This isn't because it's super powerful, efficient, or even affordable, although with current eBay prices, I do think it's a great value. The real strength of this system lies in its extensive features and options, which are often missing in other desktop systems. Plus, it's a gateway into a modern server platform that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. So let's go check it out. If you're looking for a home server, I really think a system like this could be a fantastic deal. But speaking of deals, make sure you don't miss out on the Prime Day discounts on the Nexode lineup of products from Ugreen, the sponsor of today's video. Prime Day is a fantastic chance to snag some great Ugreen products, whether for yourself or as gifts for friends and family. If you're like me and often struggle with birthday gift ideas, a high quality charger or power bank is something anyone will enjoy. I actually gifted one of my best friends a Nexo charger, and he's mentioned several times now how much he loves it for charging everything from his Steam Deck to his MacBook Pro. The Nexode 100 watt charger is perfect for keeping all of your devices charged, thanks to its 4-in-1 multi-port design and wide compatibility. Plus, with up to 100 watts of output on a single port, it charges them fast. For on-the-go charging, the 145 watt power bank is also a great option. It supports Power Delivery 3.1 and can provide up to 140 watts on a single port or fast charge three devices simultaneously. With its massive 25,000 milliamp hour capacity, it can charge an iPhone 15 over five times, yet still only takes two hours to fully recharge. So whether you're treating yourself or hooking up friends and family with great tech, don't miss out on Ugreen's Prime Day deals from July 16th through the 21st with discounts up to 41% off. So make sure and click the link down in the description to pick up your Nexo charger or power bank today, or I guess on Prime Day. This is the Lenovo ThinkStation P520 a workstation first announced back in 2017. These high-end systems would have originally sold for well over $1,000, but I was able to pick this one up for just $200 on eBay. Now, I get why many of you would want to avoid buying something from Lenovo, even secondhand, but there are actually a lot of compelling reasons to pick up a system like this for an affordable home server. Before diving into all of that though, I just wanted to make sure the system worked as expected. For some reason, I was expecting it to be much bigger, but it was fairly compact. It took my dumb brain a bit to figure out how to get the side panel off, but I eventually got it open. The system doesn't come with a graphics adapter, so I added an NVIDIA T1000 just to test things out. And after a minute or two, I got a post screen and then was in the BIOS where I could confirm the specs of the system. This ThinkStation P520 came with an Intel Xeon W2135, a Skylake server CPU with 6 cores, 12 threads, and base and turbo frequencies of 3.7 and 4.5 GHz respectively. A 6-core Skylake chip might not seem all that impressive, but because this chip was designed for the server or workstation verticals rather than the desktop, it opens up a lot of features you won't get in lower-end systems. For example, while the system I bought came with 64 gigs of DDR4 registered ECC memory, it can actually be upgraded to 512 gigabytes and also supports quad-channel memory. Everything is powered by a 900 watt 80 plus platinum power supply. It is a proprietary design that slots into the motherboard with headers not only for SATA power, but also to PCIe power connectors for things like graphics cards. The external IO is pretty limited with just a few USB ports, as well as PS2 ports, a single gigabit NIC, and some audio jacks. Internally though, it's a completely different story. First, there are two three and a half inch drive trays at the bottom, but supposedly some units could optionally have two more in the empty space next to it. There are also two flex bays, or really just five and a quarter inch bays, where once again, you could have optionally purchased mounts for two more hard drives. Since there was the possibility of six hard drives, there are seven SATA ports on the motherboard. And thanks to the onboard Intel SATA controller, these can be configured in hardware RAID. There's also two Gen 3 NVMe sockets behind this fancy heatsink gizmo. And these could also be configured in RAID using Intel VROC, but you have to purchase a hardware license module to do so. And I definitely didn't. I mentioned earlier that because this system is built around a server class CPU, it comes with a multitude of useful features. One of these is the 48 PCIe lanes, which is far more than you could expect with a desktop chip. This provides you a lot more expandability. You already have the two NVMe sockets, which each use four lanes. Then there are two by 16 PCIe slots, which can each deliver 75 watts of power, as well as a by eight slot, which can deliver 25 watts. There's also two more by four slots that are each running off the PCH rather than the CPU. 
You also get this other really weird slot, which sort of looks like a PCIe slot, but not really. I'm not really sure. I'm just kidding. So many of you are already aggressively typing in the comments. But yeah, this does have a standard PCI slot, which might seem a bit weird. But in a workstation system, it kind of makes sense. I'm sure there are a plethora of niche use cases where someone needs access to some old piece of hardware to get a job done. The P520 has a lot of PCIe lanes, but also allows for PCIe bifurcation on the 2x16 slots. This means you can sort of chop up those slots into 2x8 connections or 4x4 connections, which can be incredibly helpful if you're, I don't know, wanting to add 4 NVMe drives into a single PCIe slot. While just having a single gigabit NIC might seem a bit lame, this NIC, the i219LM, is a bit special. It allows for this system to use Intel's AMT, which is their remote management platform. This makes it possible to access the system remotely. So yeah, there's a lot to like about a system with all of these features, but I already know what many of you are thinking. This is made by Lenovo and full of proprietary crap. And yeah, you're right. It uses a non-standard motherboard, power supply, and case, making repair and upgrade options much more limited. You'll also run into some weird things like, for example, not having standard USB 2 headers on the motherboard, which I learned the hard way in my last video where I looked at a Lenovo ThingStation. While these quirks can be annoying, they can also be helpful, like for example when swapping components or cleaning out the system. Other than the motherboard, which was screwed in like you would expect, every single other component was removed with some sort of a toolless latch, lever, or button. I had the system completely disassembled in just a couple of minutes. I dusted off everything outside, but it's currently July in Oklahoma, so I didn't take the time to set up my camera. The system wasn't too dirty, but I still just wiped everything down a bit to try to make it look a little bit better. The only issue I ran into when trying to clean things up was when I attempted to remove the CPU cooler. It was held on with some sort of oddly sized Phillips head screws that were screwed on way too tight, and I struggled to find a driver that could get enough torque without slipping. When trying a flathead bit, I actually chipped off the tip of one of my LTT screwdriver bits. I eventually switched to a nut driver and thought I was going to break my iFixit screwdriver, but managed to finally get it loose. I immediately regretted doing so though because it was apparent that someone had very recently swapped the thermal paste, probably whoever it was that screwed on that heatsink so tight. Putting everything back together was a breeze and frankly, sliding all the components back into place was rather satisfying. Now, obviously, I would have preferred that Lenovo just used standard components here to make these systems easier to maintain. However, even with all of the proprietary junk, it's still a machine designed for businesses and professionals, offering useful features and some opportunities for expansions and upgrades. So maybe this is still a good deal. The only way to tell, though, is to test it out. Now, I think the best use case for this in 2024 is as a home server, probably running a hypervisor like Proxmox with multiple virtual machines and containers. But I could also maybe see this as a useful budget workstation. I mean, to be fair, it is a Bing station after all. I also wanted to be able to run Cinebench for some quick comparisons, so I installed Windows 11. I already had the GPU installed from earlier, but I also dropped in a 10 gigabit SFP Plus card from Tingy Tech. Once I installed the drivers from Intel's website, I was able to get solid 10 gigabit speeds when transferring files to and from my NAS. I also gave my Thunderbolt add-in card another shot. I was hoping that, unlike in my recent P330 video, that it would work thanks to the PCIe power. However, that didn't seem to work, and I imagine if you really want Thunderbolt, you'd have to just go ahead and buy Lenovo's specific add-in card. I do all of my video editing in DaVinci Resolve Studio, so I gave that a quick go. When navigating a 4K project, playback was pretty smooth. But, like in previous videos, most of the limitations seem to be with the NVIDIA T1000. I probably need to get a better GPU for testing, sorry. The T1000 also seemed to be the limitation with the 4K render, which took a little over an hour and 20 minutes. That was just a bit faster than the Lenovo P330 with an i7-8700 and the T1000. I imagine if you paired a beefier GPU with the Xeon W2135 and the 64 gigs of RAM, this would make for a really solid video editing workstation. As per usual, I also ran Cinebench R23 for some quick CPU performance comparisons. Here, the Xeon W2135 managed a score of 8413 in the multi-threaded test, and 1161 in the single-threaded test. I always like to compare results from a few different systems just to get a ballpark understanding of how the CPU stacks up. I already mentioned the Lenovo P330 with an i7-8700, which managed to slightly edge out the Xeon in single-threaded performance, but fell behind in the multi-threaded benchmark. 
The closest competitor I could find from the data I have is actually this Intel Xeon E2286M that's in this Intel Nook Compute unit I took a look at a while back. That CPU, when compared to the W2135, managed to perform better in both benchmarks while drawing significantly less power. That's fairly impressive for a mobile CPU released just two years later. Speaking of power, the P520 drew 170 watts while running the Cinebench R23 multi-threaded test, and 43 watts while sitting idle in Windows. Keep in mind though that the GPU is also adding to the power draw a bit, and you could technically run this without a graphics card at all, which I do test out here in a bit. For the money, the CPU performance and efficiency isn't terrible by any means, but it definitely won't knock your socks off or anything. There are many PCs these days that draw significantly less power that would completely smash this thing in terms of raw performance. And you could probably find 8th or 9th gen Intel systems for less money that perform pretty similarly. But the CPU performance wasn't why I found this machine so compelling. If you're wanting to run a bunch of virtual machines and containers all on one system, odds are CPU load isn't going to be the limiting factor. In my experience, RAM and PCIe lanes are much more important. For example, on my Proxmox server, I rarely see the CPU load outside of single digit percentages, but my RAM usage is typically much higher. Plus, with potential for remote management, features like PCI bifurcation, and the potential for more storage space, this could be a great all-in-one home server or a serious addition to an existing home lab. So that's why next I installed Proxmox. Since I could easily access everything I needed over SSH or through the web browser, I technically didn't need the GPU anymore. So I tried out running the system without it to see how that improved power consumption. After removing the GPU, the system posted, but not without complaining about it. Without the graphics card, power dropped to around 32 watts at idle in Proxmox. I tried changing the CPU scaling governor to power save, but that basically made no difference. Still, 32 watts isn't terrible, and realistically if you're buying one of these with the intention of loading it up with SFP Plus cards, graphics cards, or a bunch of hard drives or SSDs, 30 watts might not really be that big of a deal. I could have started spinning up containers or VMs using the boot drive, but why not take advantage of all of those PCIe slots? To do that, I picked up one of these cheap quad NVMe adapters off of Amazon and grabbed four 1TB NVMe SSDs. After getting all four drives screwed into the card, I dropped it into one of the PCIe slots, specifically one of the by 16 slots, as those are the ones that support bifurcation. In the UEFI setup menu, I navigated to the settings for slot 4, and then enabled the by 4 bifurcation option. In Proxmox, all four drives showed up, so I set them up in a RAID 10 ZFS pool. Obviously with that, we get the benefit here of some redundancy and two terabytes of usable capacity, but I was also hoping to get a bit more performance. To compare the ZFS pool with the single NVMe boot SSD, I ran a very primitive test with two identical Debian LXC containers, but with one running off of the boot drive and the other off of the ZFS pool. Then I ran a few quick FIO benchmarks to get an idea of how each handled sequential and random reads and writes. The first two tests looked at sequential reads and sequential writes respectively, and here I graphed the bandwidth performance in mebibytes per second. While read performance was pretty much the same, write performance was shockingly worse for the ZFS pool. For random reads and writes, I graphed IOPS instead of bandwidth. Here, when looking at random reads, the ZFS pool was slightly better, but when you look at random writes, well, the ZFS pool only managed about half as many operations per second when compared to the single NVMe SSD. I also ran a mixed test of random reads and writes, and interestingly here, the ZFS pool finally performed better. Now, I'll be honest, I don't really know what this proves. This wasn't a very sophisticated test, and I was using pretty cheap SSDs all around. But it's still cool that you can add four NVMe SSDs on just a single PCIe slot thanks to bifurcation. Since I had Proxmox running, I did a few other things I typically would, like set up a container for Crafty Controller to run a Minecraft server, run a virtual machine for Home Assistant, and even set up a virtual machine with Ubuntu Desktop. With that, I tested out passing through the NVIDIA T1000 using PCIe Passthrough. After enabling IOMMU, adding the VFIO modules, blacklisting the drivers, and then finally passing through the graphics card to the virtual machine, everything worked pretty much perfectly. I even managed to pull off some pretty hardcore cloud gaming. Okay, not really, but I was able to run Sunshine to access the desktop remotely and do stuff like watch 4K YouTube videos without any hiccups. I also set up Jellyfin and took advantage of NVENC for the hardware accelerated transcoding. Now one thing I hadn't used at this point were any of the 7 SATA ports. 
Sadly, my system doesn't have any of the optional drive bays, either in the bottom of the case or in the five and a quarter inch bays. And that seems to pretty much be the case with all of the other listings I've come across on eBay. Fortunately though, I'm a 3D printing guy now. I found a model someone made online for a two bay cage that fits the 520 and printed it with my Bamboo Lab X1C. Now this isn't really the best design in my opinion, and it definitely didn't print perfectly, but I was still able to screw in a couple of drives and then mount it in place. With some adapters, I wired everything up and booted the system to find the drives showing up in Proxmox. I created a TrueNAS scale instance and then passed through the SATA controller so that TrueNAS could access the drives directly. And as with just about everything so far when running Proxmox on this system, it just worked without any issues. I had a virtualized TrueNAS instance with 10 gigabit just working flawlessly. Now I only set up four drives, but remember that this case also has those two five and a quarter inch bays. Those could easily be populated with something like this IC dock drive cage to add two or three more drives if you don't want to go the 3D printing route, or I guess if you just want more than four drives. As I mentioned earlier, this does support Intel's AMT for remote management. You do have to do a bit of configuration in the BIOS and then run something like Mesh Commander to actually connect to it. Sadly, Mesh Commander is no longer being supported, but it still seems to mostly work in my experience. I keep a Docker container for Mesh Commander for whenever I need it, so I hopped into that and connected to the P520. Unlike with my previous experiences with AMT, I wasn't able to get the KVM feature working, but I was able to get a serial connection, at least with the BIOS. Plus, I was still able to power on or off the system remotely, which is definitely helpful. With all of these features, it's hard for me not to think that this could be a really solid server with plenty of expansion and storage options, as well as features you just can't get with consumer systems. Yeah, the proprietary stuff is kind of a bummer, but at the same time, this system was made for professionals, not consumers, and because of that, it does offer a lot more flexibility and features than you would get with non-server or non-workstation systems from Lenovo and other OEMs. Also, while the Skylake Xeon W lineup isn't new by any means, it still seems to be in use. With other platforms like Ivy Bridge or all the way up to Broadwell Xeons, you can get used CPUs for pennies on the dollar, or honestly, sometimes just pennies. And you can pick up used Supermicro motherboards for these chips at decent prices. However, when looking for similar motherboards, but for the Xeon W2100 series, the cheapest one I could find would cost almost just as much as the entire Lenovo P520. And while the cost for these Skylake CPUs is coming down as the platform is getting retired more and more, they still aren't cheap. So while the Lenovo P520 is a very proprietary system, it seems to me that this system, or others like it, is the cheapest way to buy into this platform and get all of the features it provides. Hopefully the cost of those CPUs will continue to drop more and more as more of them start flooding the market, but if you're looking for a big performance boost now, you can get up to an 18-core Xeon W2195 for around $250 it seems. With the P520, you can also upgrade to Cascade Lake W2200 series CPUs, but it seems that these are still quite a bit more expensive. If you're interested in the P520 or any other items I've used, I'll try to have links for those down in the description, some of which might be affiliate links that help support the channel. There's also alternatives to the P520 from Dell and HP that seem to be selling for pretty similar prices, so maybe do some research on those as well. I really enjoyed my time with the Lenovo P520, and if it wasn't for the fact that I just built two TrueNAS servers, it's possible that I would consider replacing one of those with this system and then just virtualizing TrueNAS on it, and then moving all of my other Proxmox stuff over, because it seems like a very capable system. Even if it doesn't end up in my home lab, I still had a lot of fun checking it out, and I really hope you guys enjoyed this video as well. If you did, maybe like, maybe subscribe, maybe become a RAID member. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.